And I say to thee, thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. In the name of the Father, and of his Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. Venerable religious and dear parishioners, we celebrate, well, yesterday, but today also, two spiritual giants. Two men that were called to amazingly high roles. St. Peter as the very first Pope. St. Paul to be the apostle to the Gentiles. The one apostle, even though he was not one of the original 12, but the one whose thoughts and teaching we would read the most since we have 14 of his epistles. They were the most unlikely candidates for their roles. Peter was anything but the rock by nature. He was a up and down kind of person, hot and cold. One day ready to go to death for Jesus and then later on that same evening denying Jesus three times and even with an oath when he was afraid of what might happen if he was identified with Jesus. Jesus appears to them in the storm while the apostles were in the boat and he tells Peter, come and come out to me. And Peter starts to walk on the water. Jesus told him to come. And then he starts to lose his faith and he starts to sink. So would you not say a very unlikely candidate to be the rock? upon which Jesus would found his church. Many other examples we could give. A man of great heart, a man of great fervor, but that inconstancy was obvious in his life. St. Paul, most unlikely because he was one of the worst persecutors. He was all about throwing Christians into prison. Wouldn't you say that was an unlikely candidate to be the apostle to the Gentiles and to the Jews too, of course, and the one who would suffer so much throughout his life? Read the epistle for Sexagesima Sunday where he enumerates his sufferings. They make us quail, make us shrink to think of what he suffered, but he was on fire for the love of Jesus. And so was St. Peter, of course, after he learned his spiritual lessons and did become the spiritual rock through the grace of God. What is very obvious when we look at the role that our Lord gave to St. Peter is that our Lord left an authority in his church. And every society needs an authority. Somebody has to have the final say. Whenever an authority is not present in a society, the society inevitably and usually very quickly disintegrates because you need somebody to guide, to lead, direct, to get people to do what needs to be done. It simply will not survive. This is one of the most basic principles of, of right reason. You have to have an authority for a group to survive. One of the greatest damages that Martin Luther brought about was to say, there is no living authority in the church. The Bible is the authority. But Martin Luther can be proved wrong very quickly. First of all, by what I just said, that if you don't have a, an authority, the, the group will fall apart. And 
History has proved that. There are not just thousands, but tens of thousands, and very likely even hundreds of thousands of different denominations that claim to be Bible-believing churches, and they all disagree on their doctrines. Why? Because Martin Luther said, don't pay attention to any living person now. There is no authority. The Bible is the authority. And I'll show you in just a minute what nonsense that is. To say that the Bible is its own authority. But there, there's the result. Things fall apart when you don't have that authority. To say that the Bible, it's, well, first of all, the Bible doesn't even claim to be the ultimate authority. Nowhere does it say in the Bible, read this, follow this, ignore any person, and you will get to heaven. Nowhere is that to be found. And let me also give you an analogy. Let's say we were at the time of the American Revolution. A new country was begun. We're celebrating its anniversary this July 4th, this coming Thursday. And the founding father said, well, we're, we're, we just wrote this constitution, but we're not going to have an executive branch. We're not going to have a legislative branch. And we're not going to have a judiciary. We're going to give everybody a copy of the Constitution and you apply it. And it should work. Because there it is, the written word. We all know how long that country would last. It would be gone in a flash because everybody's going to disagree on what should be done. Yes, you have the same printed text. But again, without that living authority, everything is going to fall apart. This past uh, year, we, this school year, on Tuesday nights, we've been having classes on the papacy. And I do recommend, not just not because I gave the classes, but because I was able to gather all this wonderful, correct teaching on the papacy and to understand how God gave this authority to his church. And uh, you can access all of the audio recordings and also uh, the, all the study sheets at the link that's on, that's on the first page of the bulletin. But one of the things we covered was all the biblical quotes that show that Peter was given unmistakable authority. I have over 25 biblical quotes. I'm not going to quote them in full, but make a quick reference to them. And again, how can anybody look at these quotes and say, there's no living authority in the church? Well, very obviously, St. Peter was the first pope, and he had successors throughout the centuries. Number one, St. Peter's name always occurs first in every list of the apostles. That's not an accident. Number two, he alone receives a new name, solemnly conferred. Only four people in history, in the biblical history, ever had their names changed by God. Abraham to Abraham, Sarai to Sarah, his wife, because they were the, the parents of the, of the chosen people. Jacob's name was changed to Israel, and then Simon was by, changed by God to be Peter the Rock. That's very special. Number three, the name he receives is peculiarly, peculiarly inapplicable to his personal character and history. Again, shows what God can do to change an inconstant person into the rock. Number four, he is the first to confess Christ's divinity and receives promises that nobody else received. On this rock, I will build my church. I will give to you the keys of the kingdom. And he alone is told that he has received this divine knowledge by special revelation. That was in today's gospel. Number five, he is treated by the world as Christ's representative. 
Number six, from his boat, Christ teaches, and the miraculous draught of fishes and its interpretation follow that incident. Number seven, he is indicated as being the object of Christ's special prayer distinct from everyone else. Satan hath desired to sift you as wheat, but I have prayed for thee. That's in Luke chapter 22. Number eight, he was the first of the apostles to set out for, and in spite of his age, to enter the empty tomb, Luke 24. Number nine, he leads the apostles in fishing, John 21. Again, the leader, the leader, the leader. He's always the first there in that position. Number 10, he alone casts himself into the sea to come to Jesus, John 21. Number 11, he alone receives the special threefold commission as vicar of the good shepherd. This was after the resurrection, and that's when he became pope, when Jesus asked him three times, Simon, dost thou love me? And he atones for his threefold denial. Feed my lambs, feed my sheep. That's when he became the pope. And it was just before, shortly before Jesus ascended into heaven. Number, then that's in John 21. Number 12, he takes the lead in filling up the vacant apostolate. Jesus had 40 days in which to make a substitute for Judas, but he chose not to. He left that up to his first vicar. And they elected Matthias to replace Judas. Number 13, he, he is the first to preach at Pentecost and summons men to salvation, Acts chapter 2. He is the leader and interpreter of the rest, also Acts 2. Number 14, he works the first church miracle, even though associated with John. Okay, that's, that's in Acts chapter 3. Number 15, Acts 4, he is the defender of the church before the rulers. Number 16, he utters the first anathema against Ananias and his wife, Sapphira. That's, that's an, and l listen to this. Number 17, his shadow alone healed people as he walked by. He didn't even have to touch them. If his shadow fell upon them, they were healed. People were lining up the sick wherever they knew Peter was going to walk. This wasn't happening all the time, but on a, apparently on occasion it happened. His shadow would heal. And you can, and that is in Acts chapter 5. So I, I'm not even going to go through all of these quotes. And then also you'll find the early church fathers all asserting that the highest authority in the church is the Bishop of Rome. So there we have it. Unmistakable, crystal clear, couldn't be more obvious. And yes, it is a very defining thing that sets the Catholic Church apart from all of the other churches. None of them have a supreme authority. And that's why they have so many problems and go through so many schisms and breakups. And, just, and they, don't, they don't even have, of course, the fullness of the truth. Otherwise, they would be part of the, they could join the Catholic Church then. We do have a most difficult situation today because the so-called popes of Vatican II have contradicted what the past popes have taught. So it is because we believe in the papacy that we have to reject imposters. And yes, we are Sadie Vacantis. It's not the name of a new religion, but Sadie Vacantis is simply applying infallible biblical and patristic teaching, which says that the infallible, unerring head of the church is the Pope. And when you see a heretic wearing a white cassock and claiming to be the Pope, it is because of belief in the papacy that we have to say he isn't the Pope. It's not a juridical decision granted, 
but it's certainly a very obvious and necessary decision to make. Separate yourself from heretics. That's, that's the teaching of scripture. Because if you don't, you're going to imbibe their poison. So our Lord is allowing his church to suffer very, very greatly. We would love to have, to turn to a, a Pope who indeed has the Catholic faith. He has to have the Catholic faith. If he doesn't have the Catholic faith, he can't possibly be the head of the Catholic Church. He cannot possibly be the vicar of Christ. It is our duty to be loyal sons and daughters of the church according to our role. Priest, religious, layperson, married, single, be a loyal son and daughter of the church. That was one of the last things that St. Therese said before she died. I am a daughter of the church. And in saying so, she was saying, I'm the daughter of, of Jesus. The church is the mystical body of Christ. Be the example that you need to be to be that loyal son and daughter. Be zealous. Be ready for persecution. My dear brethren, the apostles teach us this. It was no surprise when it happened because Jesus had told them if they have hated me, they're going to hate you. As a matter of fact, we read in the Acts of the Apostles, the, when the apostles were hauled before the, the Sanhedrin and the Jewish authorities and beaten and, and told not to preach Jesus and his gospel, it says they went away rejoicing because they had been found worthy to suffer for Christ. something to pray for, to understand that this is what, it, what is going to happen, but by the grace of God, we'll have the strength to, to endure that and to persevere through that. So let us be inspired by these giants. St. Peter, the head of the apostles, the vicar of Christ, the one who has had the keys to the kingdom, and it's been given to every true pope since. Let us be inspired by St. Peter, be inspired by St. Paul, and remember the grace of God can do the most amazing things. I can do all things in him who strengthens me, as St. Paul says. So, so much to be inspired by. Let us pray devoutly and, and perseveringly to these great apostles. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.